section in history of biotrimology um, as well. This is my first meeting, and I am really, really excited to be here. Um, so I want to just start by thanking everyone, thanking Meta and her amazing organizers. Um, thank you for organizing the conference, for being persistent and continuing to push through COVID, um, postponement after postponement, and I am thrilled to be here. So I did not start off in biology as loving um, substrate-borne vibrations. I was intrigued by the incredible diversity of animals on our planet. And what first drew my attention was actually the colors and the shapes and the, the crazy morphologies of animals on our planet. And I was really you know, struck with the questions of how and why. How and why do we have such incredible diversity? And as I started progressing through my academic career and started learning more about different groups, I became especially interested in their communication systems. And so um, communication, I realized, was one of the drivers, in my view, of this diversity that we wind up seeing. So I learned more about different modes of communication, animals that communicate primarily by airborne sound, um, others that use a lot of visual signals when they communicate, others that may use more chemical signaling, and then these you know, odd modalities that, that as humans we're not as familiar with, electroreception, um, thermal cues, and of course, tremulations sent through various substrates. But what really fascinated me was when animals use more than one sensory modality and kind of asking questions about how and why do we see such complex displays in animal communication. So this kind of led me into this field of multimodal communication, both theoretically and empirically, and really trying to understand how and why animals signal um, through multiple modes of communication. And you know, thinking about it from multiple perspectives, from the environment in which the animals live and how environment might influence the evolution of signaling, how their sensory systems, like these crazy long sensory legs of amblypigids, can influence their communication, and then the context as well. Is it, is it agonistic interactions? Is it reproduction, territoriality? So how do all of these things come together? So when I think about my research overview, I, this is kind of a diagram that summarizes it, where I'm really interested in sensory systems, in communication, in the environment, in all the interactions between them, and ultimately how all those interact to influence the evolution of diversity. So the groups that I work on are um, arachnids, and many of you in this room are familiar, many others may not be, um, but all of the research in my laboratory focuses on different arachnid groups, not just spiders, but other arachnid orders as well. And you might say, why do you work on arachnids? <laughs> um, but arachnids actually have absolutely incredible sensory systems. So we know a lot about spiders. We know they have these liriform organs that can detect vibrations. They have these incredible sensory hairs that can pick up air particle movement. But other orders, like scorpions, you flip over a scorpion and they have these, they're called pectines, these combs on the bottom of their abdomen that they rub along the ground as they walk. The bottom left corner here, these are sulfugids. These have um, sensory organs on their back, on their fourth pair of leg called maleoli, or racket organs. And we actually don't fully know the function of these organs yet. We have some ideas. And then amblypigids, my favorite animal on the planet, um, walk on only six legs, and their first legs are the incredibly elongate structures that are covered with hairs that can taste and smell. Um, and touch. So the sensory world of arachnids is actually really diverse and rich. And arachnids live in all sorts of different environments. Um, and even within a particular habitat, the microhabitats on which they live are very, very different and have implications for the signals that they use. So like all animals, they also have a need for communication, whether it be agonistic interactions, like you're seeing on the left here with two male wolf spiders, 
or for reproduction. The figure you're seeing on the right is a pair of wolf spiders mating. And for arachnids in particular, most of them are predators. And so this communication is really important because if you don't get it right, males, for example, in sexual interactions can often become a meal instead of a mate. So selection pressure is really high. So the story I'm gonna tell you about today has to do with diversification in spiders and specifically in a genus that I've been working on for a really long time, um, the genus Schizicosa. So for those of you unfamiliar, Schizicosa wolf spiders the reason I work on them is because within this one genus, you see tremendous diversity in phenotypes. So you have some males that have big black brushes of hair on their legs, others have just black pigmentation, others have nothing, and the females all look almost identical. And they can be found in incredibly large numbers throughout North America. So I can go to particular field sites and you know, an area of the table that Meta is sitting at right there, I could collect 150 animals just in that space in some of the areas. So you can get really, really large sample sizes, at least for some species. So they're found across North America. Um, and you can see that a, a lot of them are in the eastern part, but there are some that have a western distribution as well. And then they live on a variety of different substrate types. So some are specialists on pine litter, others live on leaf litter, others live in grass. So this is a morphological phylogeny produced by Gail Stratton in 2005 that maps on the um, ornamentation of males. So the red bars you'll see, these are species where the males have these big bristles on different appendages. The blue bars, they have pigmentation but not bristles. And then the black bars, they don't have any ornamentation at all. Each of these species also, relevant to this conference, has a species-specific vibratory courtship song. So they um, produce courtship vibrations that they couple, couple to the substrate and transmit to females. So these are just two examples um, of these top two sister species pair here. Schizicosa ocreata is on top. So this is a species with big brushes. You can see lots of leg waving. You can hear the vibrations as well. And then this is Schizicosa rovneri. And that is all he does. <laughs> so no brushes, no leg waving, basically stands there and slams his body on the ground. So I want you to remember these two species because it's gonna be relevant to a piece of a story I tell in a minute. So I'm gonna tell kind of four different vignettes of my research. The first one is gonna focus on the evolution of ornamentation in this genus. I'm gonna tell you a story about sensory divergence between two closely related species, talk a little bit about what we know about substrate um, specific signaling in the group, and then the potential for selection on vibratory signal complexity. So the, the first story is gonna focus on the communication piece of this kind of triangle. Um, and I wanna take a step back to talk about historically multimodal communication when it kind of first became a field, people talked about categorizing the function of each component of a multimodal signal. So in my wolf spiders, we have different morphologies that is probably visual signaling where we have some species with brushes, some without. And then we have the dynamic movements, the leg waving as well. In other species, they may not have as many leg waves, which would also be considered um, visual. And then we have these substrate-borne vibrations. And so kind of a, a traditional historical approach would be you can draw this line between the two, look at the function of visual signaling, look at the function of vibratory signaling, and start to understand the evolution of multimodal signaling. This is not the way we approach it now, but this was the way we were approaching it when I was a graduate student. And so I designed this um, experimental paradigm where I could isolate each of these modalities. So I could run mating pairs on granite, which is depicted on the right here, which 
the spiders could actually not couple their vibrations to the granite, so it effectively ablated that vibratory signal. And then I could run them on filter paper, which transmits signals beautifully. And then I could run them in the light, so the visual signal would be transmitted, or in complete darkness. So I could have this two by two design, run mating pairs through them, and try to get an idea of the importance of each of these sensory modalities. So I've done this over the years for a large number of species within the genus. Um, and you can come up with a table like this where does the vibratory environment influence mating? Does the visual environment um, influence mating? And you can get a series of yeses or a series of noes. So let's focus on the visual environment. Um, you can see right away that there are fewer species for which the visual environment matters than there are the vibratory environment. But we're really trying to um, figure out this kind of evolutionary picture here. So how do we translate these yeses and nos into something that is meaningful in an evolutionary context? So we can go to the morphological phylogeny and we can say, okay, which of these species has ornamentation, which has brushes? And you can see that brushes, according to this morphological phylogeny, independently evolved multiple times within this genus. So we can go back to this and we can put little stars next to the species that have brushes and say, okay, maybe that makes sense. Some species with brushes also have an importance in, in visual signaling. But what we really want to do, again, is take this evolutionary approach. But this is an old phylogeny and it's based on morphology. Um, and so what we really need is a more rigorous evolutionary framework in which to place these data. So um, through the funding from the National Science Foundation in collaboration with Dr. Jason Bond at UC Davis, we set out to um, kind of uncover the evolutionary relationships in a much more rigorous way. So um, it was mostly Dr. Jason Bond's lab with uh, Dr. Jim Sterrett, his postdoc, and they used anchored hybrid enrichment. They had a data set of more than 400 sampling across 23 Nearctic species, multiple populations of multiple species. And the take homes, just very briefly, are that the New World Schizocosa is not monophyletic. There are species considered in the genus from South America that actually don't belong in the genus. There are multiple species that we've been calling species that are um, not uh, reciprocally monophyletic, not good species names, and we see multiple gains and losses of ornamentation. And I want to focus on that part, but just to say, so this is the phylogeny, don't worry about the details. I'm going to point out a few things. At the bottom here, this is if you can't read it, it says Western Schizocosa ocreata and Schizocosa rovneri. Those are those two species that I showed you where one has brushes and does the active leg waving, the other has nothing. They are not genetically distinct. And everything we throw at them, they are not genetically distinct, even though behaviorally they are very, very different. So that's a story for another day. I'd love to talk to people about that, but I'm not going to focus on that today. Um, but I will say that similar to the morphological phylogeny, we get two big groups of schizocosa. This we're calling clade two is mostly the western species, and then we have clade one, which is a lot of the eastern species. And clade one is where most of my research has focused, mostly because I've been on the eastern part of North America for most of my career. Um, but this is also where we tend to see a lot of the diversity of ornamentation. So this is looking at the brushes on the forelegs of males. You can see um, the red box depicts the kind of hypothesized ancestral state, which is thought to be not dimorphic, so males without ornamentation. And then you can see that brushes are proposed to have been gained at least six times and lost three times. So we see multiple gains and losses of this ornamentation, which is just fascinating to me, um, that selection is clearly um, acting in multiple ways on this secondary sexual trait. This phylogeny um, kind of uses color to depict the degree of ornamentation. So the more blue species are more highly ornamented, and then the red species are less highly ornamented. And you can see a lot of the blue in that bottom clade. So this is where a lot of that morphological diversity 
we, is housed. So what we can do is we can take that ornamentation score and we can take my behavioral data of how important visual signaling is and we can ask whether there's a relationship between how ornamented a species is and how important the visual signal is. And we can do this using a phylogenetic regression so that we're taking phylogenetic relationships into consideration. And what you see, what we find, is that there's a really nice relationship. So as the species get more ornamented, they tend to rely more on visual signaling. So you might expect this a priori um, that the, these ornaments are used in sexual selection and in reproductive interactions. Okay, so we can go back to this then and focus on the vibratory signal because that's why we're here. We're at the biotremology conference. Um, and we can look at this and say, wow, the vibratory signaling is important for most of the species that we have looked at thus far. When we kind of map this on the phylogeny, the pinkish red boxes all represent species for which we have looked at the vibratory signaling and the importance of vibratory signaling. So again, we've done a lot on clade one, not as much on clade two. And this is color coded based on how important the vibratory signal is. So the green boxes are species where vibratory signaling is really important. The blue is where we have some indication that visual signaling is also important. Um, so we can do the same thing we did with visual. We can take the vibratory signal and calculate how complex it is. And then we can look at how important the vibratory signal is. The axes here are flipped from the visual. I apologize for that. I just noticed it. But when we map this on, we actually do not see a relationship between how important the vibratory signal is and how complex the vibratory signal is. And this is going to be a theme that comes up multiple times in this talk because these wolf spiders live on really different substrate types. They signal on really different substrate types. And our working hypothesis is that the substrate types are actually what's driving the vibratory signaling, less so than sexual selection. Sexual selection is driving the visual signaling but the vibratory signaling is really important for these spiders to be able to transmit effectively on these different substrate types. Okay, so we go back to this phylogeny and you can see two sister species in the middle here for which we have no data. So we wanted to dive in and look at these two species in particular because they are another example of a sister species pair most closely related to each other that vary dramatically in morphology. So one has brushes on the legs, the other doesn't, and their behavior is slightly different as well. So Schizocosa bilineata has these big brushes on their forelegs and Crassipalpata does not. So these are the courtship displays of each species. The top left is Crassipalpata first, so this is the non-ornamented. This is in slow motion. And then bilinea. Okay, so I also want to point out these are videos, um, this is in slow motion, taken by Dr. Rowan McGinley, who's going to be giving an online talk later on in this conference, but on tree hoppers, not on spiders. Okay, so we wanted to kind of dive into this and figure out what's going on with these two species. This is again a collaboration with lots of colleagues, including confirming the sister species relationship between these two um, with my, my partner in crime, Dr. Jason Bond, and his lab. So Crassipalpata, non-ornamented, bilineata, has brushes. They actually live in very similar habitat types. They live in kind of open grassy fields. And when you look at at least previous range maps, you see that there's areas of sympatry. So there are locations where both of these species are found. And in fact, a lot of the data that I'm going to show you comes from populations where we collected both species. So both living in the same environment at the same time, 
which makes it even more interesting. Okay, so we really wanted to know what role does visual and vibratory signaling play in the courtship display of these species? So our first objective, we wanted to see whether or not there was any potential to convey information in each modality for each species by testing for diet dependence of both visual and vibratory signaling. So the assumption here is that if um, there's diet dependent signaling, that's a way in which receivers can actually acquire information about the health quality condition of a signaler and you might expect um, communication signals to be more diet dependent than uh, other traits. Then we wanted to look at the role of visual and vibratory signaling across these two species. So first to test for diet dependence, um, we ran um, diet trials in which we fed individuals either a high diet, so they got four crickets once a week, or a low diet where they got one cricket. We raised them on these diets, um, and then we looked at various traits, um, signaling traits. So on the left here, this is Crassipelpata looking at the vibratory courtship signal, and these are just principal component analyses, basically combining all our measures of vibratory signaling into the, the principal component that conveys the most information. So we have high diet on the left, low diet on the right, and for Crassipelpata, we see that vibratory signaling is diet dependent. So you see they have vi higher vibratory courtship signals, and again, this is the principal component combining everything than low diet males. But when we look at bilineata, we see no difference. So we have diet-dependent vibratory signaling in Crasspalpata, but not in bilineata. When we look at the visual signal, really the only thing we um, can look at here is the brushes. And so we've kind of controlled brush area for the size of the spider. So here we have leg length on the x-axis, brush area on the y. We have high diet and low diet, and again, we see that diet is, brushes are diet dependent in bilineata. So you see this high diet male line is above the low diet male. So even controlled for size, um, bilineata high diet males have bigger brushes. So vibratory signaling reflects male quality in crasspalpata, and visual signaling reflects male quality in bilineata. So then we wanted to look at the function of each of these signals. We use the same design where we can ablate the visual and vibratory signal, run mating trials, um, see how often they mate. And what we find is that, so let me just walk you through the x-axis. The L is the light is present or absent. L plus is light present. L minus is light absent. And then V plus is vibration present. And V minus is vibration absent. So we find that vibratory signaling um, influences mating success in crassipelpata, and you can see really clearly that as long as there's a vibratory signal present, the pairs can mate readily. But in the absence of that, even in the presence of visual signaling, mating is very, very low. We see a very different pattern in bilineata, so the vibratory signal is important for crassipelpata. In bilineata, we see an interaction between visual and vibratory signaling, so in the presence of light, in the presence of a visual signal, they made a lot. They made a lot less in the absence, but if there's a vibration, they can still mate more. So this interaction happens in the absence of light where the presence of vibration actually rescues some of that mating. So for this species, light is most important, but, but vibration appears to be a decent backup in the absence of light. Okay, so what we have here is um, Crespalpata vibratory signaling is diet dependent. Pairs are more likely to mate in the presence of vibratory signaling. For bilineata, brush size is important and visual signaling is important, but vibratory signaling can be important in the absence of visual signaling. So we have these two species that overlap in range, overlap in microhabitat within that range, are active at the same time of the year, and when you look at their vibratory signals, they're fairly similar. So we started to wonder if maybe part of this story is that there's competition for signaling space in this environment between these two species that may have led to sensory divergence. 
So Dr. Eric Kirschenbaum at Cambridge University helped us with some analyses to look at the details of the substrate borne vibratory signaling between these species. And then Schizocosa duplex, the one on the far right, is the closest relative to this species pair. So you see there's quite a bit of overlap in all three species, actually, in terms of the um, timing of the pulses of their vibratory signal. But when we look at the frequencies, there's a higher overlap between bilineata and crosspalpata than there is with duplex. So a, a working hypothesis is that vibratory signaling is ancestral in this group. We know that. That these two species live in the same place at the same time using the same substrates for signaling. And that potentially competition for vibratory signaling space led to divergence where one might even be more nocturnally active and the other more diurnally active, um, leading to divergence in the sensory modalities that they rely upon. So we have differential reliance on modality-specific signaling in these two sister species, and we propose that it might be due to competition for signaling space. Okay, so going back to this, we can now add crossbulpata and bilineata to this list. And again, you can see that there's a lot of green. There's a lot of importance of the vibratory signaling. Um, but again, there's no relationship between the complexity of the vibratory signaling and how important it is in mating success. And again, we think this is because of these substrate types. So I want to switch and focus a little bit on these substrate types and on the environment in which these animals are signaling. So this story has multiple species, multiple collaborators over the years, including even uh, Dr. Andrew Mason um, from some early work on this. So lots of authors there. The first story is going to be about Schizocosa strigillans. So this is a species that doesn't have the brushes, but you can see they have dark pigmentation on their tibias coming down to their femurs. And this is what their courtship looks and sounds like. Okay, so they live in complex, deep leaf litter habitats, deciduous forests across North America. This is kind of a spider's eye view of the habitat that they live in. So this is what their environment might look like for them. Um, but in this same area, there are other species that will be, you know, two meters away in more pine litter or there'll be a patch of kind of sand or red clay and there'll be another species there. So we wanted to look at different microhabitats in the environment that where these spiders live and look at how well their signals transmit and how well they would do mating on these different substrate types. So we focused on deciduous leaf litter, pine litter, and sand. And again, because these three microhabitat types are actually really common um, where these spiders are found. So the first thing we did is we looked at how their signal transmits uh, across these three substrate types. So we have the root mean square amplitude on the y-axis and the distance in millimeters on the x-axis. And you can see for this particular species that leaf litter transmits best. So you see that the signal attenuates least on leaf litter as compared to clay and um, with the red clay or sand and pine. We then did mating trials across these three substrate types, but we also wanted to look at the importance of the vibratory signal. And um, thanks to some great work in collaboration with Damien, we actually figured out how they produced these signals. And so because we knew the production mechanism, we knew how to silence them. So we effectively glued their two body parts together with a drop of wax to prevent their abdomen from moving. And that is one of the main ways that they produced these signals. They also produced them with their palps. So by using droplets of wax, we could glue body parts together and effectively silence these males. So we had muted males, and then we had our control group of non-muted, where we would put the same amount of melted wax on a different body part that didn't um, prevent the production of vibrations. We ran these mating trials. 
Um, so this is first looking overall at muted versus unmuted males. We found that muted males made it significantly less and you can see that here where 73% of the non-muted males mated and only 7% of the muted males mated. We took these non-muted males and looked at them across the substrate types to see how substrate influenced this. So here we're looking at just those non-muted males, the proportion of males that mated and then the different substrate types on the bottom. And what we see is that they mated more on leaf litter by a lot. So this is the substrate that they're found on. This is the substrate that transmitted their vibration best and the substrate on which they mated the most. So we get a really nice signal substrate match for this particular species, suggesting that this substrate type may have been really influential in the evolution of this particular vibratory signal. We've done this now for a variety of other species. I'll throw, show you just a few. This is Schizocosa ocreata. This is that brush-legged species. And they have pretty high mating success across substrate types. Um, so you can see leaf litter, pine litter. We've added grass now. They mate well across all of those. Leaf litter is the substrate on which they are typically found. We have Schizocosa duplex, another species that is found in the southeast but they're found primarily on pine litter, and what we see is that they actually mate better on pine litter than they do on these other substrate types. We have the vibration um, information from these species too, but have not analyzed them yet, so you'll have to wait for that, those data. Okay, so we can go back to this and say, um, we've looked at a lot of species in terms of how well they mate on various substrates and how effective their vibratory signal transmits, transmits sorry, across substrates. But we have these odd species in clade two, and I wanna highlight Avida and Retorsa, where these boxes are gray. And these boxes are gray because there did not appear to be an influence of the vibratory signaling environment on mating in these species. So I'm gonna dive in a little bit and tell you about Schizocosa retorsa. So of all the species in the genus, this is my favorite, probably because I worked on it as an undergrad. This is what got me into spiders. But they are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful spiders. They have black um, femurs, the males do, and then the rest of their leg is actually lighter than their other walking legs. They have this beautiful scalloped midstripe on their prosoma, and they're found primarily in pine litter and in this kind of red clay that you find in the southeastern United States. So same questions with stridulans. We wanted to see how well their signals transmit across substrate types and how well they do mating across substrate types. But again, these bottom two, pine litter and the sand or red clay is where this particular species tends to be found. So first we look at the transmission of the vibratory signal and we see that their signal transmits best on leaf litter and pine litter. So the uh, blue line and the black line, leaf litter and pine litter, you see the lowest attenu attenuation as compared to this red clay. When we look at the proportion of pairs that copulate though, we see that they actually pop copulate more on the red clay than they do on these other species. So again, pine litter and red clay is where they're found. This is where they mate most, but their signal transmits really well on leaf litter. So in this species, we don't really see this same match between substrate type signal efficacy and function. Um, so we wanted to ask maybe the, vib maybe the visual signal is what's compensating for this. So these males have these black um, legs. They're highly contrasting. I'll show you their courtship in a minute. But we thought, well, maybe it's the visual signal that they're relying on in these kind of open sand clay habitats. So we ran mating trials in the light and the dark across these three substrate, substrate types. Um, to look for an effective visual signaling, and we see that it does not matter, even in the dark, in fact, in the dark, almost more so, they mate on the red clay as compared to the other substrate types. So the visual signaling is not explaining this high mating success 
in a microhabitat on a substrate type where their vibratory signal does not transmit well. Okay, so I'm gonna take you back to the initial data. We, we have multiple experiments showing these same data of that light dark um, paradigm where we looked at their mating in the presence and absence of visual and vibration. And the thing I wanna point out here is that when both of these modalities are gone, they still mate pretty frequently. So in the absence of visual signaling, in the absence of substrate-borne vibratory signaling, this species is still doing a really good job of finding each other and mating. So this led us to the question of, is there maybe another sensory modality that they're using that we are not, um, that we haven't been paying attention to, and is it maybe air particle movement? So I'm gonna diverge slightly and tell you a story about hidden sensory modalities here. So the senses that we are most familiar with as humans, vision, touch, hearing, taste, smell, um, substrate-borne vibrations are one that we are not as familiar with as humans, but everyone in this room is very familiar with. But there are different groups of animals that use different modalities that are also outside of our perceptual world. So vipers can use infrared detection. There's electroreception of platypus, ultrasonic detection of bats, magnetoreception. These are all things that are not obvious to us because they're not sensory modalities that we tend to use. So another one that often gets overlooked is near field sound. So in the far field, airborne sound transmits as pressure waves, but at close sources to that sound, you actually get circulating air particles that have not yet formed these pressure bands. So close to a sound source, there's air particle movement, and this is referred to as near field sound. We know actually a lot about near field sound in terms of predator avoidance. This is one of the reasons it's really hard to kill a cockroach because they have these hairs on the back of their cerci that are really sensitive to air particle movement. And so as you're coming down to try to step on them and squash them, they feel the air particles generated from your foot and they're gone before your foot gets anywhere close. We also know a little bit about air particle movement and its function in communication from some work that I've done in amblypidgids. So just a quick kind of uh, biodiversity overview. These are the different arachnid orders in pink. Amblypidgids are highlighted here. They are fairly closely related to spiders, but they are not spiders. They are these amazing animals in their own order. They again walk on only six legs, but they have eight, and their first pair of legs are these elongate, incredible sensory structures. When these animals get together, especially to males, they will engage in agonistic interactions. Basically, they fight. And this is work that Dr. Casey Fowler Finn, who is also giving a talk later in the conference, did as an undergraduate with me um, when I was a postdoc at Cornell. So um, this is what real time, what this fighting looks like. So this is taken with an infrared camera in complete darkness. We see the side view. So they kind of adopt this asymmetrical pose where they open their one pedipalp, they face off, and then they take their antenniform legs and they vibrate them really fast. And then one eventually retreats. If they're equally matched, they can actually battle. So this is a battle where you could see they're using their antenniform legs. Each opens their pedipalps. And we'll see it from the side view where they kind of raise up and come together and try and push each other over. So we were really interested in what communication is happening during these agonistic displays. And in particular, what role this antenniform leg waving had. And it turns out we used some um, high speed uh, videography to show that the legs are actually not touching the other opponent. So initially, it had been proposed in the literature that this was tactile, that they're actually kind of whipping or hitting their opponent. When you look up close, that's not the case. And when you map where those legs are on the opponent's body, you see that they are focused on the patella of the opponent. 
And when you look at that patella, there are two long sensory hairs called trichobothria in arachnids that can detect air particle movement. And we calculated that these legs can actually generate air particle movement. They have these trichobothria that can potentially detect it. And then we did some electrophysiology studies where we created a motor that mimicked the vibration and we stuck electrodes into these sensory hairs and effectively showed that these trichobothria can detect the waving of these um, amblypigids during these fights. So air particle movement can be used in communication and can be used in communication in arachnids. Okay, so Schizocosa retorsa actually has a display where they wave their legs really, really fast. And using some mathematical modeling, we could show that this rate of leg waving also generates air particle movement. This is what it looks like. So that rapid leg waving at the end there. So that can generate air particle movement. And there are these long sensory trichobothria all over the females and the males. So they're generating this potential cue. They have sensory systems that should be able to detect it. So we wanted to know whether females can detect air particle movement with trichobothria and whether this might explain how these animals are mating in the dark without the ability to transmit vibratory signals. So we came up with an experimental design where we couldn't figure out how to ablate the signal, so instead we decided to add noise to it. So we um, used these giant speakers. For one treatment, we removed the cone, the speaker cone, and so there's no longer that directed air particle movement onto the spiders. In another treatment, we left the cone there. We played um, white noise. We played we did it twice because the first time our sample size wasn't quite big enough to convince us what was happening, so we repeated it again. Um, but so with the speaker cone playing, there is actually air particle that's generated with a speaker cone playing without the cone, with a speaker playing without the cone, you don't get that directional air particle movement. So we have noise added in the near field and no noise. When we look, so again, we ran it twice, experiment one, experiment two, we can see that across both of those, pairs were more likely to mate in the absence of noise than they were in the presence of noise. In this species, though, we know that that leg waving, the rate at which the spiders wave, is really important in female choice. So we looked at the rate of leg waving in noise and no noise, and we saw that males actually altered their behavior. They courted at a higher rate in the no noise than in the noise. So this was why we actually repeated the experiment, because we weren't sure our results were driven by variation in male behavior or actually the female's perception of the signal. But when we look at the rate of leg waving between spiders that did and did not mate, we see that males that mated had higher leg waving rate, and this is regardless of the environment. So even with the noise added, females were able to perceive in the near field, I should have said, this was run in complete darkness and on granite. So the other two modalities are ablated. So the only thing these spiders could be perceiving is either tactile cues from running into each other or this air particle movement. So um, basically, we think that air particle movement is being used in this particular species where females are actually perceiving the rate of leg waving by the air particles that males are generating. OK, so substrate-specific signaling, all focal species um, match their highest mating success with the substrates on which they're found. For most of the species we've looked at, their substrate-borne vibratory signals transmit best on their natural substrates, suggesting again that there's this selection for signal efficacy on each substrate type. And then where we do find this mismatch in Schizocosa retorsa, we actually think it's due to a third modality that we hadn't been paying any attention to. 
which is air particle movement. So females were still able to assess displays based on leg waving, um, and we know that leg waving produces this air particle movement. Okay, the last little vignette I wanna tell you about is selection for signal complexity, and this is focused just on vibratory signaling, and again, a whole team of researchers were um, participating in this project. And this, the analysis was led by Dr. Nori Choi. So I will tell you now, if you have questions about the details, you need to contact Nori, not me. <laughs> um, he's brilliant at this. So, okay, Schizochosis stridulans, this is that species we talked about first um, in terms of the signal substrate match on deciduous forests. They, you can separate their substrate-borne vibratory signal into three components. You have revs, which sound like this. You have the idols, which sound like this. And then a very short leg tap, which is percussive. So it's important to note that both the idols and the leg taps are associated with visual cues as well. So the leg tap, just by the name, it's a leg tap, so the leg is actually moving to come down on the ground and hit it. So the visual and vibratory are linked in those two components. So we used a camera and a laser vibrometer, um, let males and females mate, and then went back and assessed the vibratory signaling and matched it to mating success of males. So what Nori did was he was able to um, use some sophisticated <laughs> algorithms to convert courtship signals into a sequence of basically letters, <coughs> excuse me, and then use that to um, use to com compute complexity matrix. So this is kind of going back to information theory and using information theory to calculate complexity metrics, and he com calculated three different types of complexity metrics. One, lempel zip complexity, looks at the temporal patterning between components. Shannon entropy looks at proportions of components, and then entropy rate looks at transition rates between components. So calculated different complexity metrics and then asked, does the complexity of the vibratory signal influence mating success at all? So here we have our three metrics of complexity on the x-axis. Um, we have the, the uh, signal complexity for each of those values on the y, and then we're gonna see pairs that did and did not mate. So the n is they did not copulate, the y is they did. And what we're gonna see is that um, Males that copulated had higher complexity scores across all different types of complexity. So if a male had more patterning, more transition rates, more proportions of particular components, they were more likely to get a mating than those that did not. When we, we also kind of did a traditional way of looking at rate where we just kind of count the number of leg taps or the number of vibratory components and looked at whether um, the courtship rate in either of those predicted mating success. And what we find is that for vibratory signaling, there was no difference, but for visual signaling, those that had a higher visual courtship rate were more likely to mate. But again, remember that visual courtship rate is linked to vibratory signaling. Um, we saw that males were actually plastic and how complex they could be. So males that were paired with females that were heavier, males that mated with females that were heavier, heavier actually increased the complexity of their courtship rate. So we see that for males that were successful, if they had a heavier female, they increased their courtship complexity as they were courting, suggesting that this is something that can be dynamically adjusted by these males. So we see that vibratory signal complexity predicted a male's mating success. The visual associated signaling also predicted it, but again, that those signals are, are linked. We saw that, and I didn't show you these data, but 
Successful males actually increased their transition patterns if we looked across time during that courtship. So again, suggesting plasticity of male signaling. And then they altered their signaling based on the female condition. So females may actually be assessing male vibratory signals based on the complexity itself. There may actually be within species selection for complexity in the vibratory courtship signaling, which is pretty exciting. Okay, so I told you these four different stories with the evolution of ornamentation. We saw that there are multiple gains and losses of ornamentation, suggesting variation in the patterns of selection. And we saw that there is this trend towards ornamentation being related to mating success, suggesting that sexual selection is happening for the visual signals. We talked about those two species, Crassopelpata and Bilineata, where it looks like possibly competition for substrate-borne signaling space might have been important in driving divergence in their use of sensory modalities. We see that substrate-borne vibratory signaling is often matched between the natural substrate that these spiders are found in terms of both efficacy and uh, mating success. And when it isn't a match, in that one species at least, it seems like there might be an additional modality that we had not been paying attention to earlier. And then we see that selection for complexity itself may actually be a driver of substrate-borne vibratory signaling within species. So now that we have this amazing, rigorous phylogeny, um, we're looking at how the light environment also influences signaling success across multiple species. This is um, work led by Dr. Rowan McGinley coming out soon in AMNAT. Um, we are trying to use um, some sophisticated software to take an unbiased look at the dynamic visual signaling and be able to actually quantify that in a way that we can place it in a comparative phylogenetic context. This is work that's being led by Dr. Kenna Lehman. And then we're led by Nori Choi. He's develop developing some deep learning um, uh, analyses to extract features and calculate com complexity metrics again without our subjective bias on what is a component, what isn't a component, so that we can look across species and place everything in a comparative phylogenetic context. So with that, there are many, many, many people to thank. Um, and you can read that as I will take questions if you have any. Thank you so much.